I'm a feminist, but I have been arguing with my teenage son and insisting that he definitely pay when he takes a young lady out and that he continue to insist because I know this young lady and I don't want her mother to think I've raised a cheap boy. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but if I were granted a wish by the good body genie, I would give myself amazing legs because I love my body, but I hate my thighs. (laughs) Even if I knew that a woman somewhere else who liked her legs would get mine. (laughs) True story. I'd give these thighs to any of you, but (laughs) just... I'm a feminist, but when my daughter said to me that she may never get married, I went into the bathroom and cried. (laughs) Because bills and admin are so hard, and who would do hers if she's as shit as me at it? I'm a feminist, but there's a woman I once worked with who was so mean to me, I would ask the good body genie especially to give her my thighs. (laughs) She's really thin. She's got great legs as well. She'd just wake up in the morning, be like, what the fuck? (laughs) She's much more petite. Like, these babies work on me. I mean, I'm I'm tall, I'm broad, I've, I've got heft. They wouldn't, they wouldn't work well on her. I don't care. I'd give them to her even though I'd have to keep them as well. I'd just replicate them. I'd clone my legs. That's how mean she was. Serves her right. I'm a feminist, but I get facials and veg peels for myself. However, if my husband doesn't notice, I ask him if he doesn't love me. <laughs> I'm a feminist and a grown-up, but I really want the good body genie to be real. (laughs) Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White and Sindhu V. Very special guest, Charlotte Regan, talking about bringing up feminist boys. The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So here's the thing. I've got a challenge. Cindy's got a challenge. But I really want to get Jarlath on because I feel like we need a guy in the conversation now. Um, So he's a fantastic comedian and he does an amazing podcast called An Irishman Abroad. He's also, I think, saint might not be too much because he's just given a kidney to his brother who apparently needed one, and... Jarl- well, we certainly Jarl- hope so. Jarlath... Oh, God, it- maybe it was just an awkward birthday present. Like, I didn't... <gasps> Shit, I forgot! Like, um, <laughs> have a kidney! Um, and uh, Jarlath had was all like, I've got two, why don't you have one? So he's pretty much a great guy, and if you need a kidney... Apparently, he's given them out. Uh, so he's a big fan of the podcast, and he was always so sweetly, because he's a very well-known comedian, and he's got his own amazing podcast, but he would always message me, and I said, I'd really love to have you on. What would you talk about? And immediately he said, raising my son as a feminist. And I was like, what a fucking great topic. Uh, please put your hands together and make all sorts of excited noises for Jonathan Regan. <laughs> Jala, thank you so much for joining us. You have a son. I do. And you are raising him as a feminist. Yeah, well, first of all, I do want to say this, that I am a feminist, but... I know, brave. (laughs) Brave, brave, brave. Because because it's okay for you guys to go, I'm a feminist, but, but, you know, I'm actually still a feminist. But when a guy goes, but, you're immediately going, you're not really. (laughs) (laughs) Who do you think you are? There should be no buts. Here's mine. I'm a feminist, but... Uh, the Cindy Lauper song, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, when I was a young lad, really pissed me off. <laughs> so I was like, what do you think boys want to do? <laughs> it, uh, it genuinely used to annoy me. Really? As a four-year-old, I was like, God damn it. 
It was like the Shambhasi chocolate mousse. Just don't tell the children. That, you remember, no, you're way too young to remember that ad. But there was an ad on the TV for chocolate mousse, don't tell the children. And I was like, they love chocolate more they than know. anybody. <laughs> you I took think a lot of media very literally as a sport. You did. took it to heart. You yeah. took it to heart. But you know, I just thought of, do I have a I'm a feminist but And mm. that was the one that came into my mind. And it does tie into raising my son a feminist because I had two older sisters and I felt put upon at that <laughs> age by women and by this idea that it was the boys versus the girls. And that is an idea in teaching that is just not there anymore. You never, in a classroom, go, okay, well, the girls are very organized, so we're gonna have the girls versus the boys here, because it sets up that paradigm where there's a kind of antagonism mm. between the two yeah. groups. Now, I'm so aware that that's not happening in Michael, my son's life, at six years old, but I kind of had a feminist awakening this year. Not that I ever thought I wasn't a feminist, but on my show, I had Bridget Christie on, I had a, a girl called Louise O'Neill who wrote an amazing book called Asking For It, and they just got me reading, and they got me realizing that this is our problem too. This is not, as Bridget said, this notion that somehow women need to sort that sexism thing out. It's the men that are doing the sexism. You know, we're the ones guilty of this behavior and guilty of it for God knows how long. So how do we change that? It's through changing the young men that are coming into the world. And that's where this all began. Mm, yeah, completely. <laughs> I went into a school today, this was my challenge, I went on Facebook and said, hey, because I don't have kids, so I was like, hey, does anyone know of a boys' school or a school with boys in it that I could come and talk to about feminism? And then I was rushed off my feet. People were like, yes, like 12 people immediately, like, yes, you can come here. So I ended up going to this boys' school in um, Middlesex, or I don't know, there were some teachers in. Is it a boys' school or was it just the boys in the school? We weren't there, we don't know. It's what? <laughs> no, I'm asking the teachers in the audience. Oh. We're... It's a mixed school, but we asked for boys. Okay, it's not a boys' school. I went to a school in Middlesex. Southall. Southall. <laughs> I don't know where I've been. And do you know what? I recently, with The Guilty Feminist, I played the Brighton Theatre Royal, 950 people, and afterwards I thought, oh God, it's interesting, because it's like, once there's this many people, there might as well be loads of people behind you. Like, I don't feel nervous, I don't get nervous, I really enjoy coming out on stage, it's fun for me. But going into a library with 12 boys sitting in a ring, who were between the ages of 12 and, I guess, 16, 17, my heart just started to... I just thought, what if they just stare at me? Or what if they heckle me? Or what if they're like, what the fuck is this? Why do we have to listen to you? And it's going to be something they remember forever. Yes, so don't fuck it up. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh, God. And I really... I felt a bit nervous. And these two sweet boys, they came to the reception to collect me. And they knew I was a comedian, so they were kind of doing a few gags. They're trying out a few gags on me. <laughs> It was really sweet. We went upstairs into this library and they were all sitting around in a ring. And so I just sat down and said, what do you think feminism is? And they all had really good answers, but they were like, some of like 12 year olds going, uh, well, it's a resistance against the patriarchy. And I was like, wow, <laughs> what? They like knew what the patriarchy was. Or and they then I owned would say, phones with Wikipedia available to them. Yeah, I guess I'm always so worried when a youngster gives me an answer that's really clever. They're like, you fucking looked that You've up. You Googled yeah. it. Yeah. But you know what? That's the same as looking at a book, Charles. Mm, it is. Like, if it's yeah. like when like your mum like yeah. your mum says, you know, what's the capital of Australia? And you go, Canberra. You read that in a book. <laughs> you didn't know it's that. It's still good they looked it up. It's yeah. good, yeah. Looking things up on the internet that's is a just thing. a speedy library. <laughs> it depends what you look up, obviously. Um, <laughs> sometimes there are bad books in that library um, but yeah they all had answers about you know that it was about gender equality and that they understood that and I said is everyone included at Villiers school like if I turned up here today and I didn't have an invitation would I have just been allowed to come in and use your library and they were like no I said we're all included some places and not included others but you go home to your parents tonight 
if you knocked on the door and they opened it, they're kind of legally obliged to include you. They're not going to go, oh. And one of them went, my mum does make that face when I come to the door. <laughs> it was really funny. So then I talked about the history of the patriarchy and, you know, when it began and the idea of women and children being property. And we looked at also people of colour. Most of them were people of colour. And so we talked about that and different ways that we could be included or not included and different power structures. And I said, the truth of the matter is, if we were at the front of this school and a police officer walked past, if I said, this boy stole my iPhone, who would the police believe? And he went, you. And I went, yeah, because I'm more included in that system. I look like a white middle-class woman who's going to be telling the truth. Mm. And there'd be an assumption made about you. Mm -hmm. And we started looking at that and what assumptions do we make about women and what assumptions... Do we make, who do we include, when do we include them? And then we started looking at when would you ally for someone? When would you stand up for someone? Because they all agreed with the idea of equality. But I was like, yeah, but okay, would you step in? And I said, be honest with me, I'm not, you don't have to give me the right answer. And they gave varying answers. One little boy, who was the sweetest little boy, he went, yeah, I would. He said, I was in the changing room at the swimming pool one day and this man started saying to somebody else that women weren't good at maths. And I just said, excuse me. <laughs> he was 12. He was really short as well. He was so cute. He just went, excuse me. That's just absolutely ignorant. They are. They're just as good. <laughs> and he said, but what was really interesting is he was really confused by it because he said, I didn't understand it because he was a black man and I thought he's had prejudice. Yeah. So why is he being prejudiced? And I said, well, it doesn't always work like that. And we had to sort of, that was quite delicate area, but it was really interesting and nuanced. And then I said, we talked to this other boy and this other boy said, no. I said, when would you get involved? If you saw someone being bullied for being gay, would you step in? He said, no. And I said, why not? He said, it's not my business. And the teacher said, would you be worried other people would think you were gay? He said, no, it's just not my business to get involved in that. And so we started talking about what's your business. And I said, and because he was Asian, and I said, as a white person, if there were only white people on the bus, except you, and someone started being racist to you, is it my business to get involved? Would you want me to go, hey that's not okay. He went, yeah, I would. And I said, well, then my business has to be the people business, not the white lady business. And your business can't just be the Asian boy business. Your business has to be the girl business. Your business has to be the gay business. And then we all started talking about what was our business. And then that really helped. I think that was a really great team way of clubbing together that's and going, amazing. you're my business. Like, you know? I'm I know. sorry, um, this is amazing. I know. So, uh, absolutely amazing. If you're going to talk, if you're going to talk at another school, can you give me advance notice so I can remove my son from the school he's at and get him into oh, that school? The easier thing would be presumably just to come to your kid's school. That would be an easier <laughs> fix. That's true. Um, but here's a couple of things I thought were incredibly encouraging. Just quickly before we go on to Sindhu and Jarlath. I started talking about when someone says the first person to do something. So the first person to fly in a hot air balloon. Who do you imagine? And they said a white man. And I said, and if it's the first woman to do something, who do you imagine? And I sort of answered and said, see, and you also you would think of a white woman. But they interrupted and said, no, no, no. I would think first woman sounds to me like first lady. And then I think of Michelle Obama. <laughs> and then we started talking about how long the Obamas had been in the administration. And they said they were all between three and eight when the Obamas came in. So they said, for us, no. And I said, can any of you remember a president before Obama? And that was the really interesting thing, that most of them were going, no. And then one of the kids went, Nixon. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, you've been held back a few years. <laughs> and I the went, Benjamin Button kid in the school. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Richard Nixon, first president I can remember. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, it was a big scandal. I don't know. Um, and I was like, no, no, not what other presidents do you know about? Like, do you remember being on the TV or being on YouTube or whatever? And they were all like, no, we can't. One of them said, maybe I can remember Bush. I don't know if I can remember. I just remember that I've seen him since. But they were all like, no, when we think of the first woman, a lot of the time we're thinking of Michelle Obama. And they all talked about Obama. And I said, OK, so that's what representation is. You as boys of color, you get yourself seen. So wherever you are, if you're asked to be on a panel, you don't go, oh no, I don't know this. Or if there's a presentation to be done, you get out on that stage. Because young people of color need to see you. And you make room for women to be on that stage. You invite a woman onto that panel or into that room or in the university student union board or whatever it is. Because representation matters. Because you think of a black woman because Michelle Obama was in your sight line. And that was really encouraging to me how much they were already there, how much they already knew 
And then right at the end, one of them just said, so do you all comedians, do you know each other? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I know a lot of comedians. And they just went, do you know Russell Howard? And I went, oh, yeah, a bit. And they said, can you give us his number? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't really know him that well. I know his sister. And then one of them went, can you give us his sister? <laughs> And I was like, and that's the end of the lecture on feminism. Uh, so it was so great. It was so great. It was very moving. And I felt like they really gave me hope for the future, that there was so much already in them. And one of the boys gave a sort of rousing, moving, like sort of sermon at the end saying, it's not what we say, it's what we do. And we've got to start doing this stuff and not just saying it. And it was really coming from them. And I think the next generation, God bless us if we can get there and if Trump doesn't blow us up and if it doesn't all fucking fall apart in some horrible way or another. This next generation, I have great hope for them. I have great hope for your children and your children and, you know, the children I've nannied for who I'm very close to. I feel like it's almost like it's slightly different cloth, that they're made of something slightly different. I agree. Wow. Yep, that was my challenge. Wow. I recommend it, guys. I would say if you know someone at a school and you're a feminist, whether you're a man or a woman, just say, I'd like to come in and talk to the boys about feminism. Maybe you want to go and talk to the girls about feminism. Maybe it's a mixed group. Schools will let you come in and talk about shit. Who knew that? <laughs> They'll just let you come into the library and give little... No, obviously, use your power for good and not for evil, but that's news. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Deborah Francis White. <laughs> So tonight we're talking about raising boys as feminists. It's an important job, it's an important job. And so I started thinking about why, and I thought about the two times in my life that stand out for me when men have gone to bat for me as an ally. And this is why I want people raising their sons as feminists. So the first one, I was very young, I was on my gap year, I had just got to London, and I was very naive and virginal. I was, in fact, at this point, a Jehovah's Witness. Now, regular listeners will know that I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. People who are here for the first time, lock the doors, bring the cart out. No. <laughs> no, I'm no longer a Jehovah's Witness. I am an atheist now. But at this point, I was a young, naive Jehovah's Witness. I hadn't been kissed. My hand hadn't been held. I was completely, like, vulnerable and not very comfortable in my own skin. But I was so excited to be in London. And I used to take myself off to the theatre after my job. I was temping, and then I was, you know, doing a bit of door knocking. I'd, to be honest, I'd let the door knocking lapse significantly. <laughs> I was in London. Come on. So I'd gone out that night to some, you know, Noel Coward play or something that I was so excited because I was in London. And I thought, what do you see in London? You see Noel Coward, sure. I was from Australia, is what I'm saying. And I... <laughs> And I'd gone off on my own to see this Noel Coward play and I'd got the programme and I was reading it on the tube home and I was sitting there on the tube and a man next to me turned and said, have you just been to the theatre? And I, being a young Australian woman from a beach town where people speak to each other, said yes. I engaged, I made eye contact. I thought, oh, this man is interested in the play, I thought. This man's interested in the play and he's interested in me and he wants to discuss the works of Noel Coward. <laughs> Perhaps he was also at the theatre this evening. Perhaps he's seen Phantom of the Opera and will tell me about that, I thought. So I said, yes, I went to see a Noel Coward play. And he looked at me and he said, can I see the programme? And I was like, okay, it's a bit, bit odd, but sure. And then he just had the program in his hands and he was twisting it and twisting it. And he just looked me in the eyes and went, can I be your boyfriend? <laughs> and I just went, caught out of the corner of my eye that there was a man there. And I just went, this is my boyfriend, Bob. <laughs> and the guy sitting here was a young guy about my age. He went, yeah, I'm her boyfriend. <laughs> He was American, young American guy. I'm her boyfriend, yeah, I'm her boyfriend, we're together. And then I just looked across at this young couple sitting across from me who were going, oh, what's going to happen next? And I went, we've just been to the theatre with Beth and Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and they just totally played along. They just went, yeah, we all went together, it was good. And then what we did is we created a little tribe together <laughs> where we started discussing the play. And this is the best thing you can do as an ally. Started discussing the play in which Andrew, not his real name, <laughs> said, I thought the first act was a bit slow. <laughs> didn't you? And I said, I did, but it did pick up after the interval, didn't it? And then Beth, who was enjoying it, 
said, um, yes, I thought the Lady Caroline, I don't know if she was the understudy. And this went on and on and on until we had discussed an entirely fictitious play. And this man just got more and more and more shut out. And Bob, my boyfriend, leaned across and he took the programme from this man's hands. He smoothed it out and he put it back into my lap. And then I looked at him because I was getting off at the next stop. And I was like... And he just went... So we got off the train together and we went, Bye, Beth. Bye, Andrew. See you next week. And then we got in the lift and it was just really this romantic moment. And bear in mind, I had never been kissed before. We were just standing there in the lift and I was like, oh. And he went, I'm so sorry. I'd like to kiss you, but I'm a Mormon. (laughs) And I said, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. (laughs) And he said, oh my God, really? (laughs) And I think he thought I was taking the piss. And I was like, no, I really am, I really am. And he said, I'm meeting my parents now. And we came up and there were his Mormon parents. And they were like so sweet to me. And they were so hopeful that I was a Mormon girl and I had to tell them wrong, weird sect. (laughs) But we said goodbye and he kissed me on the cheek. And I was like, you know what? That was an ally. He was an ally. Because he didn't go, oh, weird thing happening here. Don't know what it is. You know what? He played along. And I think it's one of the best things you can do. And I feel like... Just create, you don't have to challenge someone. You don't have to say, you know, if someone's being racist or aggressive, you don't have to challenge that person. You don't have to talk to that person. I read this advice. The best thing you can do is just start talking to the person they're attacking and talk to them about something normal. But my added extra is pretend you're friends. People who do this, they're cowardly and they don't go after 12 young Muslim women in headscarves. They go after one. So what you do is you just turn around and you just say... You know, just randomly pick a name and if there's a young Muslim girl with a headscarf on and you just turn around and you just say, Asadi, are you okay? And then somebody else, you just get someone else to chip in and go, Jeff was a bit weird at work. (laughs) And you just start creating this bigger and bigger tribe of people going, Andrew, have you got any chewing gum? (laughs) Until it's clear that the whole tube carriage is with this person And you're the only cunt with a problem because we've all just been out to see a Noel Coward play. That's my recommendation. The other thing that I think could work, what if you just started a flash mob dance? I don't know, this is just an idea. I don't know, I'm making this up now. But like you have your flash mob song. This is an idea, actually. Okay, I'm just brainstorming, but I think this actually is an idea. Okay, everybody who wants to align themselves and be allies uh, to people of colour against racism, to people of the queer community against homophobia, and to women against aggressive sexism, why don't we have a flash mob song that we all do a dance to? We all learn it. All the allies learn it. We all ally up for each other, and we all learn it. Okay, and so somebody's like being aggressive to this woman and anybody in the carriage can get out the song and say it's, I don't know, give me a good song that would work. I'm happy. I'm happy. So the the Pharrell Williams, is that his name? Yeah. So suddenly one of you just pumps, happy, and people just start going, until the whole carriage, all of the allies in the carriage, and everyone's like, flash mob, flash mob. I'm telling you, the dickhead who's like, will be like, oh no, I have finished here. I'm getting up here. I'm telling you, it's not a bad idea. Because then nobody's going, hey, you know, stop that. And then like, you know, being stabbed, we're all just dancing. Until like, we're just like, if you don't know the steps, dude, get off. That fucking King's Cross, mate. You gotta know the steps. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The other guy in my life who really allied for me, and I'll never forget it, So I was quite a new stand-up comedian and I was invited to Australia to the Melbourne Comedy Festival and one night I was asked to host uh, the Fringe Club which is a sort of late night kind of bear pit feel comedy club and it started around like one, two o'clock in the morning so people were very drunk when they came in and then they got drunker and drunker and drunker so they had to put the headline act on first (laughs) because it was just no point later. Um, And they asked me to compare this night. So I went out and I wasn't, I was like experienced at my thing, but I wasn't experienced at this thing, which was riot control for drunk people. So I thought, what am I going to do? Because they weren't 
I got an audience in any way. They were all talking to each other and looking at each other and they were just like ordering drinks at the bar. There was nothing about this. Like, oh, welcome to say Jim Francis White. And everyone just continued on. So I had to come out and I thought, I'm going to have to get them to be an audience. And so um, I got them shouting out. I wasn't doing material. I was like, hey, you, if I point over there, you say, hey, you point over there, you say, ho, that kind of thing to try and get them to <laughs> work really well. Fuck you. And, <laughs> and I, so I wasn't even doing material. And this guy just shouts out, do jokes about periods and vaginas. <laughs> and the whole audience went, huh. <laughs> and I just, I'm not this kind of comedian, but I just, everything came up inside of me. And I just walked over and I said, what's your name? And he went, Khan. And I said, well, Khan. Just because I have a cunt and you are one doesn't mean I have to do jokes about them. <laughs> no. And then I brought on the next act. Now, I got them back together and I thought, I've handled that pretty well. I've handled that pretty well. It's not a joke that I'm proud of, but it is, in that moment, I just thought, no, you have to shut it down. And I got a round of applause. It was all great. And then I brought on the next act. Now, I'd never heard of this guy. He was 18 years of age and he'd been flown out from America. And we all thought, 18 years of age, how good can he be? We'd never heard of him, but apparently he was some kind of YouTube star. But this was like six years ago when we didn't really even know what YouTube was. Like it was we knew it was a thing, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, we, I didn't really get, I just thought there's a child coming out now. Um, I introduced him as on as a Tim Minchin I could have given birth to. And he... <laughs> Because he played songs, and I went, okay, please welcome Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham comes out onto the stage, 18 years of age. I mean, it's the first time I think he performed outside his bedroom. He wants this Australian audience to like him, right? He came out onto the stage, he passed the piano, and he came over here and he went, You, are you Khan? And the guy went, Yeah. And he went, Yeah, I thought so. You look like a cunt. And then he just berated this guy for like 10 minutes saying, do you think that you can speak to women like that? This woman is a comedian. She's doing her job. That is what she is doing. In what world is it okay for you to shout out that she should do jokes about periods and vaginas because that's what you imagine women think about because that's what you think about when you think about women because you're so fucked up in your head, Khan. And I tell you, if you do this at a comedy gig again, this is what's gonna happen to you. Some guy is gonna come over and berate you for 25 minutes because we don't think it's good any more than she thinks it's good. And this audience hates you and everybody hates you. This is not an appropriate way to behave, Khan. <laughs> and then he went over to the piano and sat down and sang a song about maths. <laughs> and it was the greatest song I'd ever heard. And I thought, what? This kid rules. Because he wasn't coming in like a shining knight on armor. He knew that I dealt with it, but he was just saying, the opprobrium isn't just from women. It's from other guys. We also think this is hateful behavior. And I bet Khan never heckled like that at a comedy gig again. Ever since then, I've always had a really big crush on Bo Burnham. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what did you do for your challenge, Sindhu V? Well, I grew up in India, but obviously the way that I was raised, I guess my father was a feminist. At that time, no one said, I'm a feminist, you're a feminist. It was just taken for granted if you were doing things a certain way. And so I have very feminist instincts. And my husband is Scandinavian. So when he was in school, he had to get a license for his sewing machine. And all the girls, the little seven-year-old girls, went to carpentry class. So he's feminist like... I can't even sew. Yeah. So what's happening is the challenge for me is this, is that we genuinely think our kids will pick it up and our son will pick it up just from growing up in this house. However, the challenge is how do you make him engage with it actively as mm -hmm. opposed to saying he'll just pick it up because we are that kind of household. And the reason it's important to me that he actively engages is because there's a requirement. You know, if you're going to be a young man who's raised in a very feminist environment, then use the credit you have to go the step forward further, mm. you know, uh, and bring your friends with you. And the challenge is he's a teenager. 
he doesn't even want to look at my face, <laughs> let alone talk to me, let alone talk to me about feminism. Do you know what I mean? So the challenge is how to get him to actively engage without ramming it down his throat mm. so that he thinks, well, this is, you know, this is something that's important to her, so let me immediately not do it. And I'm not kidding. Teenagers go through this thing, don't they? Or at least here they do. I never went through it. Anyway, um, so the challenge is to get him to think about it in terms that it sort of comes into the conversation without being explicated. And um, so we had a conversation where I said to him, what do you think is so different about me now versus when I started doing comedy, which was four years ago? And before that, I'd been a stay-at-home mom, so he'd only known me at home. And he thought, well, first thing he said is, mate, why are we talking about this? I was like, no, 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 please tell me, tell me, tell me. And he said, here's what I think is different. Comedy Sindhu is really happy. Not comedy Sindhu was not happy. And I said to him, why do you think that is? And he said, well, I think it's because now you're doing what you really want to do. And it's something that's giving you happiness, and because that's as important to you as it is for dad to do what he wants to do. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. Because your father goes out and works nine to five, this and that. Your mom, as far as you're concerned, takes off every night and comes back slightly pissed and says, you know, this is my job. <laughs> and, uh, and you're able to see that she has as much of a right to do that as your father has to do what he does. Um, and it really made me happy. But I think the challenge is bringing it to your kids in a way that is both more active, more engaged, but also something he'll absorb and not take as, you know, this is what you should be like. Something I talked about today was the arbitrary, because kids kind of like philosophy. They like to think outside the box a little bit. And I was saying, like, I've come today in a skirt because I'm allowed by society without anybody looking twice at me to wear one piece of fabric around my legs. Or I could have come in with two pieces of fabric around my legs and worn trousers and nobody would have looked at me. But what if you came in with one piece of fabric around your legs? They were like, yeah, people would look at us. And I was like, I'm allowed to put color on my lips. I have done that. Have you noticed? No. But if you had red color on your lips, would people notice? Yes. And then I said, what do you, do you think boys are excluded from? And one of them said, knitting. <laughs> And I was like, right. I was like, and he said it just, and he was an Asian kid. He said, I think to be honest, it's an Asian old lady thing. And other kids were like, no, it's just an old lady thing. <laughs> and I was like, so what if one of you at lunchtime was sitting with your phone and someone else had a book and someone else had a fidget spinner and then you just, one of you boys just got your knitting out. <laughs> and, and the little boy who stood up to the man at the swimming pool went, I'd do that. <laughs> and I went, I bet you would. I bet you would. And he said, and everyone would just be like, oh, how did you learn to knit? And the other boys were like, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> Keep it going for Cindy B! Hello, hello, thank you. So I have a teenager, and the thing with children, when they're very small, it's easy to manage them because you just lie to them. <laughs> they don't know anything, okay? <laughs> My youngest, she's, I don't know, five or six or something. Anyway, she, um, she came to me the other day and said, Mommy, I've decided. I know what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a mermaid. And I was like, that's fantastic. Well done. Because it's 7.30 in the morning. I'm not having the fucking conversation, right? We have to get to school. So I said, that's great, honey. And she said, well, how am I going to do it? And I was like, oh, you'll go to Mermaid University. <laughs> Whatever. She has no idea, you know? And she said, oh my God, where is that? And I was like, uh, Australia. Because lots of fishy things happen in Australia, right? Someone's always getting eaten by a shark or whatever. It's easy, but when they get older, you have to properly discipline your kids. You have to be a proper parent. And I'm born and raised in India, so what I consider healthy, high quality, robust parenting techniques are frowned upon in this country. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. They're illegal. They're fully <laughs> illegal in this country. You know, as much as I want to have a really well-behaved kid, it's no use to me if I'm in jail. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, so I had to learn what you do here, the way you do it. And of course, here, the big thing is talk to your kids. Teach them about action and consequence. So you have stuff like the star chart. You know this? Thank you for only biting your sister twice today. Here is a star. <laughs> or you have the naughty step. You've been terribly behaved. Please go relax on the staircase. <laughs> So 
you know, I had to do that kind of thing. And uh, so my firstborn, you know, who was sort of the one I did all that with, he is now a teenager and he is impossible. You know, I don't know if anyone here has teenagers, but oh my gosh, this boy doesn't listen to me. He doesn't answer me back. He doesn't, well, he answers me back, but not when I want him to, you know? Um, and it's really very, very stressful. And of course, you can't complain about it here. You know why? Because it's his hormones. <laughs> It's not his fault, it's his hormones. Neurological pathways, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you know, it's not his fault and he'll come out of it eventually. And hormones, nature, listen, in India, your biology is not allowed to get in the middle of how you behave with your mother, okay? <laughs> um, let me ask you this, how many of you have seen planet Earth recently? <laughs> yeah, how many of you saw the clip of the iguana and the snakes? <laughs> the baby iguanas and the snakes, right? Who hasn't seen it make some noise? Woo! Right, here's what you do. After this, you go home, you Google baby iguana and snakes, and then the next three minutes will seem really funny. <laughs> but for the rest of you, do you remember the little iguanas are born and the snakes eat them? The first one, the second one, the third one's coming out of the egg like, holy shit. <laughs> Did you see? And his or her little eyes are like, what? Anyway, it comes out of this egg and legs it towards the mom, remember? And running, running, and the snakes are coming. They're raining snakes. And you know, you know, you were like, run, baby, run! You know you were doing that. Go, go! And it's going, and you're like, run! I have never cheered any of my kids this way in my life, right? And he or she's going, and then the snakes get him. And you're like, no, no. And then David Attenborough's like, well, today it seems like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> run, run, shut up. And this little iguana, did you see? It got away, because it had one leg free. And it's running. At this point, literally, I mean, this was the most emotional I've ever been. I was like, go, go. And it jumps, and the snake jumps up. And I'm like, fuck off, snake. I was going nuts. And it jumps up, right? And it lands in front of its mom. And the mom's like, where have you been? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I was born. And then these snakes came. And they ate John. Then they ate Sarah. And I was so scared. And she's like, well, John and Sarah have a good reason to not be on time. <laughs> Did you see that? And my friends were watching it with me and they were like, oh my God, look at the baby iguana. I'm like, what? Look at the big iguana. My mother is inside that iguana. <laughs> she didn't give a shit about nature or biology, you know? But I don't have that luxury. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not an iguana. Um, so, uh, so I have to deal with this, this boy. I mean, like, at, of course, at a meta level, I love him. He's my child. <laughs> but, like, on a daily micro basis, I don't know, really. <laughs> um, so, anyway, I'm going to just tell you straight up. He came to me the other day and said, Mom, can I have 10 quid? And I said, for what? And he said, stuff. <laughs> and I said, what stuff? He said, it's nothing bad, mate. <laughs> In my head, I was like, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail. So I better talk to him. So I said, I'm not saying it's for anything bad. I need to know. He said, ah, oh, that's the problem with you, mom. You're so intrusive. So I said to him, okay, first of all, good word. <laughs> like, solid word. Why are you feeling English? I don't understand. But second of all, do you know what it means? He said, yeah, it means you are always up in my grill. <laughs> so I said to him, no, darling, no, no, no. Intrusive is you taking a shit in my stomach for nine months. <laughs> Your challenge is to raise your son a feminist. <laughs> yeah. How do you do that? Because he's small, well, right? The first thing that has to be said is, I have an amazing wife, Tina, and you know, I said to her, I just wish that the two of us could come in and do this together because 
you know, she's the one leading that She could have fight. come. She, of course, why didn't we do that? I don't know. I know. And it was like getting on the train going, this is ridiculous. Oh, God, she's the one that leads the battle. But I guess it's, you know, the headline is that, you know, you're a dude doing it. And I, I am not just doing it quietly behind the door. I'm outside talking about it. And mm-hmm. she's not a public person, right? I talked to her a lot about it today, about how we are doing it together, because you're his role model for a man in the house. And she, like, just on the very small level of just explaining to him that we never discriminate on those grounds, that that's just not something that comes up, that there's nothing that you can do that she can't do, that women occupy all the jobs, every single job. There's absolutely no reason. Why not? Can you think of a reason? And it's that kind of on a daily rolling basis that it never comes up. And when you spot it, you catch it, and you crush it like a bug each time. You go, that's not okay, is it? And you let him identify it. And the funny consequence of it, the brilliant consequence of it is that he will actively say, I am a feminist, and he will... How old is he? He's six. And he says, I'm a feminist? Yeah, 100%. 100%. And okay, he... I don't have any children. Could I have him? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you see, this is the annoying thing about having a good kid as a stand-up. You really need an annoying little... Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think Cindy took up stand-up to talk about her children. Yeah. So, um, this little boy is going to turn into a teenager. Yeah. And I know you've raised him this mm-hmm. action and consequence way. Mm. That's what's going to happen. He, enjoy him now. Enjoy him now. <laughs> yeah. But I, I fully get why that's funny and why that's, you know, potentially what's going to happen. But you're trying to head them off at the pass for all your worth. You're going right? to have a grumpy teenager who's of a feminist, course. trust me. Yeah, yeah, still, yeah. So then you'll have more material. But like, I'll tell you, <laughs> like Tina said that she's in danger sometimes of going too far. Like at one point she was walking up from the shops with, this is going to sound crazy, but this is a something that happened and I'm going to tell you what happened. He was like nearly in tears and he said to her, I just wish I was a girl. Oh, and, I, and she was like, what are you talking about? You're, you're brilliant as you are. He's like, just, you, you're always telling me that girls are so great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I mean, you know, now we've got to kind of row it back Roll it back, roll it back, roll it back, roll it back. But your life's so much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, but like, <laughs> but that's, but isn't that it? Isn't that the, it's a weird balance that mm. you're, trying to strike and the equality balance is what we're after like it is a challenge there's no question about it because from my perspective like while trying to teach him to be a feminist like i'm not a perfect feminist i think that you this wouldn't is... be allowed on the show if you were because we are called the guilty feminist <laughs> of course and we but again like i said at the start it's okay for you guys to be guilty feminists but there's something that blocks a lot of men from declaring themselves feminists because they feel like if I put one foot wrong, you're not really a feminist. And that's what's beautiful about what you've done here is it lets you own your feminism despite your occasional drop-offs. Our ugly paradoxes. (laughs) But when a man has an ugly paradox, he's like, oh, I can't really say I'm a feminist now, can I? But I know that I'm trying to unlearn a Catholic education I'm trying to unlearn the fact that I'm raised in a country where abortion's still illegal. Like, that just still, like, gets me so fucking angry that I come from a country where the government don't trust women with their own bodies. Like, that just, it riles me every day. But it's understanding that that in your environment has an impact on how you feel or your unconscious bias. Have you ever done the Harvard Implicit? No. It's basically Harvard have been gathering information about our biases. It shows you faces and words and you've got to group them and you see pretty quickly we're all incredibly sexist about how we associate women with domesticity Mm. and we associate men with business. And if you think you don't, try the test and see. So, you know, my total point is totally my point is there are unconscious biases that I'm trying to unlearn and peel back in myself and prevent from occurring in him. And I'm not going to get to them all because, as we know, 
they're fucking everywhere. How, they're how in you, everything. How do you guys deal with toys? Because you know toys are so gendered now, more than they were when I was a child. And it's not that we just remember it that way. There's been research done on it that Lego was sort of for everybody. And now Lego's in the boys' section and everything in the girls' section is pink. That was definitely not the case when I was a child. How do you deal with gendered toys? Well, I guess he's moved into, a, like, again, I scratch my head with this kid because, you know, some of the stuff that he does is just not regular kid behavior and you are looking at him going i mean could you not just like run up a slide for once you know the normal kind of shit kid behavior of running up slides and face planting and going down (laughs) i mean he's now into writing and he's got a writer's shed under his bed oh my god and yeah like he writes me a note before he goes to school to wish me good luck with my writing and i'm like (laughs) what the fuck am i gonna do with this in terms of comedy, Michael. Can he hang out with my uh, son? So, Can he hang out with my 15-year-old son, yeah. please? But like you say, there's going to come a turn, but he's a Lego guy. We've Sit never had that. the gendered toy issue. But that, again, is another one that you kind of can't... Mm. How do you get to it? Because the divide is happening in his class right now, that the mm. girls are in one section of the yard plaiting each other's hair. That's happening. And the lads are suddenly going... I'll be playing with those girls. You know, this Mm. is suddenly the split that's occurring. And I guess what I'm actively trying to encourage is that you have girlfriends. And those are not something that we were probably all used to, of going, oh, is she your girlfriend? Mm. No, she's she's my friend who is a girl. She's a friend, and those things are good. I know that's only a small thing, but like I say, these are just the daily steps of it and you're in a battle to do it that is my challenge do we have any questions um how do you would you guys deal with like the gray areas of gender when you're teaching your kids like my mom like raised us very equally my brother spent most of his childhood in dresses but he's now like a 21 year old fully fledged human and the other day was like transgender it's not a thing is it and I I don't know if he's being an asshole just to piss me off, but how do you deal with that in a day to day basis? My mum sort of glazed over. I uh, personally, with Tina, just deal with it head on. I think you just go straight there, whatever it is, that he's able to ask the question and get an absolutely straight answer that this is the reality of the world, this is something in the world, this is how it exists, and... Uh, we accept it, just as we accept trees are a thing in mm. the world. That's how I do it. I don't know about that's you, exactly what. That's exactly right. It's a thing. It happens. You have questions. Come ask me. I think the more you can introduce small children to... Because small children are learning everything. So they accept. Mm. I remember I was staying with some friends, and they lived in the country. We were all sort of staying over for a long weekend. And one of the kids just said, why do Uncle Philip and Uncle Glynn sleep in the same room? And... Somebody looked, one of the grown-ups looked at the other and went, do you, do you want to take this? And uh, there was a sort of, uh, you know, and then I just was like, well, you know how Tom and I are married? And they were like, yep. I said, you know how mummy and daddy are married? And they were like, yep. And I said, so Philip and Glenn are married. And this little girl, she just went, oh, I didn't know that two boys can be married. Oh, okay, cool. And that's it. And that's over then. But it's like, she didn't know that. She lived in the country, you know, it was like... <laughs> There are no gay people there. No, they just didn't have a lot of... It was... Okay, it was the Austrian countryside. Very remote. They didn't know that many people. So they only... I mean, they did know people. I'm making this bad. You know what I mean? She just hadn't seen that before. She'd obviously met gay friends, but they hadn't stayed the night. So she just hadn't clocked it. And as soon as she clocked it, she went, oh, okay. And so that's sort of what I was saying to the boys about one piece of fabric or two. Like, if you see a man with one piece of fabric, or you see somebody who's outside the conformity we put people into, what, it's, it's so arbitrary. Why are we desperately trying to get everyone to conform, to look the same or be the same or identify in the same way? It's weird. Conformity is so weird. And if you can kind of flip it round and ask them a bit, I suppose ask them questions about how are you different and how do you want to be accepted for your differences? If we pushed you more towards conforming this way, Would you want that? No, neither does that person. Mm -hmm. But more of society conforms in a way that that person doesn't. You're very lucky in as much as the ways in which most of the time you wish to be are married with conformity. So, hey, lucky you. But you don't want to be pushed into those places that you don't want to conform. Ed, we have another question here? 
Um, just kind of uh, what you're talking about with sort of gendered toys and stuff about, I suppose. I was doing a, a project with parents recently at work and kind of went out and interviewed loads of parents around the country. Um, and I was quite kind of surprised outside of sort of our liberal bubble, I suppose, at how there was not just a feeling of, you know, girls prefer pink because of toys and stuff, but a really genuine feeling from actually the majority of the parents that it's just, it isn't like innate that girls like certain things and boys like certain things. And I was just finding it really hard to get past. They were just, some people were kind of, she just naturally, like she was born loving princesses. She really wants to paint. She's not going to use this product I was talking about that, you know, was green or yellow because it needed to be pink. I just wondered, like, how could kind of... I didn't really know how to respond to that and I, I don't know how I could kind of change the conversation and sort of convince people that that's not really the case. Well, like uh, Deborah said, these kids seem to be cut from a different cloth. What you're describing just now was us making the cloth from which they're made. That, you know, Michael, my little boy... There was never a suggestion that pink belonged to girls because pink looks brilliant on guys. And he owns a pink shirt that he enjoys wearing. With well, He's going to sound like a crazy kid now because he has suspenders that he wears with, that, with the pink shirt. That uh, I know it sounds silly, but it's that simple thing of going, no, that doesn't belong to one or the other. And I know what you're saying about the... Frozen is a girl's movie, and that's a thing that gets said. But we enjoy it. I enjoy it. Like, I think as the dad, you have to be immediately going, that's nonsense. I think Frozen's a superb movie. Oh, that's hilarious. It is. Yeah. And let me show you some other yeah. examples of the genre. Yeah. Uh, I would say also, we are in a little bit of a time where we celebrate in children, we celebrate the masculine and not the feminine in terms of archetypes that if a girl likes a princess dress, we go, oh, put her in a superhero cape. But there's nothing wrong with dresses either. And I think my concern is that we get proud of girls in superhero capes and we're slightly ashamed of girls in princess dresses. And I've seen this with competitive mums. Like, oh, yours is dressed like Frozen, mine's dressed like Spider-Man. Yeah, it's like, there's well, this... is, are men better than women? Is that why this is a better situation? Well, like, I know it's... N- I know it's the archetype, but if she wants to wear a dress, that makes her feel good and pretty. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you allow that, then she also puts on a superhero cape on top of the princess dress. And also, I think there's such a fixation on what these three- and four-year-olds are doing. But the fact is, it's the other conversation that's going on in those families that's more important. Do you know what I mean? My son played with trucks and this and that and all that, and my husband had sewing class at his age, my husband only wears blue stripes. And my son wears all kinds of floral stuff. I know, because I pay for it. (laughs) So I know what it is. But my point is, it's easy to get fixated and think that we can make sure that our daughter is playing with blue toys, but then how do we behave? The toy is not going to decide for you. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's absolutely right. Let your kids show you what they want to play with. And just make sure you're keeping the conversation neutral. You know, have a lot of Lego. But if your kid wants to wear a pink princess outfit, you know, my daughter went to school dressed like a princess dinosaur for the first three years of nursery. (laughs) And she wore green glasses because she was a princess dinosaur scientist. That's just the facts, all right? Now you know. And she went as this thing, and I was like, fine, dude, knock yourself out. Um, But that's the important thing, is to not get too fixated. And if you meet parents like that, to sort of get them to talk about it in a more broad way, as opposed to change their choice of toy, because we know people get crazy about their parenting. And you won't change that. Do you know what I mean? I saw a great thing on Facebook. It was a little boy. He was in like a frozen dress. And this woman playgirl said, you're not a princess. You shouldn't be wearing a dress. You're not a princess, are you? And he said, I'm not a princess. I'm a king in a dress. (laughs) Ah... Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter at guiltfempod. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com, The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page. Sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as the new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review, 
and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. And give it five stars. <laughs> Jarlath, what is the show that you have coming up? Because you have a show about giving a kidney away. I do. And I do. all the other comedians, I know what they're doing. They're going, you fuck it, you lucky fucker. <laughs> You've given yeah. it, that's what comedians do, honestly. No, they just... I mean, it's, it's obviously, you write about what happens in your life. And yeah, my brother needed this kidney. And I felt like you could not write about it and worry about what these guys say. Because there are obviously cynical comics who go, <laughs> that's lucky, isn't it? You've got to show out of it. You're trying to wring some publicity oh. out of this thing. That's going to happen. But at the end of the day, there's people right now in London dying in hospitals who need a kidney. And pretty much everyone in this room is walking around with two. When oh, they only fuck. need Except one. You. Oh, Except you. Fuck. Now, I, I know that not everybody's aware of what live donation is or what the live organ donor network is so that you can walk into a hospital right now in the UK and altruistically go, I believe you need kidneys. <laughs> and you can give one and they'll find someone that needs it. Or if your partner needs a kidney, you can say, I'll give my one, which isn't a match and we'll get one on the network for them. Now, it doesn't immediately lend itself to stand-up comedy, as you can see. It really but does the, not, but I know but that you're going to make it amazing. Yeah, honestly, the show is called Organ Freeman, and... Uh, <laughs> Just for the title alone. <laughs> yeah. Just for the, an applause for the title alone. It's uh, going to be at the Edinburgh Fringe. I'm uh, so the entire excited festival. to see it. It yeah. just—it sounds like such a wonderful story. It's exactly the kind of comedy I love. That sort of, you know, it's turning pain into jokes and jokes into money is what comedians <laughs> do. And this guy can really do it. And I just think it's also a beautiful story. And I'm a little bit fearful now. I'll see the show and want to come out and donate an organ. Uh, <laughs> well, what harm? I mean, people run marathons to feel great about themselves at a midlife crisis point. Why is this not one of the things that you do? I have got ages to go I didn't midlife. say you were in a midlife crisis, but... <laughs> Very much what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Can I very quickly plug something? Yeah, I'd love you to. So, on uh, June 17th, there's the Change of Art Festival. And it's part of the weekend of Hope Not Hate. And it is marking the anniversary of the murder of Joe Cox. There's lots of things going on, but at the Change of Art Festival, which is on the 17th, there'll be... Uh, Bridget Christie's on, there's a Danish singing group, there's a solo dance. It's just a fantastic weekend. I'm comparing it. And the tickets are free, you just have to sign up. Because it's just, more than ever, I think it's an important thing to think about Jo Cox's work, what she talked about, and why it was particularly moving, what she talked about and what has happened with her. Uh, so if you just go to Change of Art Festival, which if you put it together, as my friend said to me, oh, you're comparing change of oh fart no it's change of art change of art festival you'll find all the details and please do come along right um. I'm doing a new podcast season. Um, it's for Timepiece, which is a new app, which is a time banking skill sharing app so that refugees can meet local people. So you could learn to play the guitar from somebody and you could teach somebody else to speak English, for example. And the podcast season that we're doing, the Spontaneity Shop is running. Firstly, anyone can do it. If you have a podcast or you want to start a podcast, it could just be you at home talking to a friend in your kitchen. If you meet a refugee through the Timepiece app, then you can register and say, hey, I'm part of the Timepiece podcast season. But there'll also be, we're going to have uh, a refugee guest on our show that we've met through Timepiece and other shows. And there's two brand new podcasts that are coming out specially for it. One is called International Dish. And the reason I want to mention this tonight is because Ned, I was his nanny when he was little and he is now um, grown up. I was also virtually a child. I was on my gap year. And uh, he does Global Pillage. If anyone knows it, he does the scores and the questions for it. And he's going to learn to cook um, from local refugees their dishes, but with the ingredients they can get here in Tesco, um, because often they have to substitute ingredients. He's going to hear their stories through food. He's going to go shopping with them. Um, so... Please watch out for the timepiece season. If you'd like to participate, you can. Lots of podcasts will be participating. An Irishman abroad, would you like to participate in the timepiece podcast course, season? Absolutely. Brilliant. We would love to have someone on, come on as a guest on Jala's show, and you should listen to it if you do not. Please go and see Organ Freeman. I'm sure it'll be touring after Edinburgh if you're not going to Edinburgh. Please go to Sindhu's Day. Please follow us all on Twitter. 
And uh, thank you so, so much for being such a warm, lovely audience. And thank you for coming out. I know it's been a tough old week for London, so thank you for coming out and being with us. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Cindy V, and our very special guest, Charlotte Regan. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp, the music was by Mark Hodge, the producer was Tom Selinsky for the Spontaneous Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Meta, Sally, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you very much, good night. Thank you. My cat, because I just feel like I want Sindhu and Jala to be able to see each other because they've spawned some. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh shit. Oh, okay, oh, no. I may have tipped water all over everything, <laughs> but I don't think anyone's noticed. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god. Um, this is where Cindy becomes a mother. Oh my god. Hello, it's Deborah Francis White from The Guilty Feminist. This week I went into the wonderful Villiers School to talk to teenage boys about feminism. The real heroes are the teachers who work there every day educating young citizens. The wonderful Edith Johnson, who was the young, inspiring, proactive teacher who invited me in, is part of Teach First, a programme designed to get young, passionate graduates planning a variety of careers to teach first and spend a couple of years teaching in a school that needs dedicated, excited young teachers that the kids can relate to. This raises the bar for many underfunded schools and also creates long-lasting relationships and investment from those young teachers who often move on to other sectors. If you think Teach First might be for you, they provide loads of incentives, or if you'd like to donate to help train more teachers, go to teachfirst.org.uk. Also, The Guilty Feminist is coming to LA on the 23rd of June. That's Los Angeles, America. The show is at the Improv Olympic. If you would like tickets, go to ioimprov.com.